Welcome back to The Response, a bi-weekly interview and audio documentary series where we explore how communities respond to disasters, from hurricanes to wildfires and reactionary politics and more. I'm Tom Llewellyn. Today on the show, we've brought on Douglas Rushkoff to talk about his new book, Survival of the Richest, Escape Fantasies of Tech Billionaires. Douglas is a professor of media theory and digital economics at Queens Cooney and a research fellow of the Institute for the Future. Named one of the world's 10 most influential intellectuals by MIT, he hosts Team Human Podcast and has written many award-winning books, including the bestsellers Present Shock, Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus, Program or Be Programmed, Life Inc., and Media Virus, as well as Team Human, based on the aforementioned podcast. He coins such concepts as viral media, screenagers, and social currency, and has been a leading voice for applying digital media towards social and economic justice. Hey, Douglas. Hey. Welcome to the response. Great to be responding with you. <laughs> so I feel like the last time that I saw you in person was actually in 2019 when Shareable co-hosted one of your tour stops while you were promoting your last book, uh, Team Human. And I feel like you told this story that was kind of the genesis for this book back when you were on the tour for that. So yeah, excited to uh, get to dive into this a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah, I was actually I was thinking about you recently because, and I'll let you jump in in a second. I'm just talking, talking over you. Um, you donated a bunch of Team Human to Shareable for us to be able to hand out to donors and all of that, which we appreciated very much. And I still got a few of those lying around. Okay. And so uh, about a month ago um, on Halloween, I started handing out the books to the parents that came <laughs> and a number of the teenagers. And their eyes just like lit up that I was giving away a book. And that there was something for them in addition to candy. And so I had about 10 different parents that walked away with their copies of Team Human very happy. So oh, good. I, I hope they were worthy parents, worthy, worthy of this, of this yeah. tome. <laughs> Isn't everybody? Isn't this uh... <laughs> All humans. <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah. So hoping we can dive in, into the book and uh, just kind of first wondering kind of how's the, how's the kind of promotion for – uh, or how has the conversations around this topic been being received? Well, it's interesting. I mean, you know, so so like you said, the the genesis of the book was this weird experience I had where I, I was supposed to do a talk, and it turned out to be just five billionaires who wanted advice on their on their doomsday bunkers. And it became this conversation about you know how do I maintain control of my Navy SEAL security force after my Bitcoin's not worth anything, you know. And so it was this this nuttiness and. And the interesting thing is that the, I use that story as a springboard to look at this kind of tech bro billionaire Silicon Valley mindset, you know, this which is important. It's it's like the set and setting for the Internet revolution and why mm -hmm. we have these sort of extractive, repressive, dehumanizing uh, techno solutionist yep. monsters um, at the helm of civilization right now. But. The most of the conversation around it seems to focus on, oh, what what are the crazy stories of the tech billionaire bunkers? How do the bunkers work? Where should I put my bunker? How do you grow food? How do you take you know control of your security force after the thing? And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's like that's that's meant as a hilarious and impossible approach yep. to yeah. our collective impending trauma right that, that that what we the the idea is that that surviving the apocalypse as an individual is impossible that we have to do it together talk to any self-respecting prepper and even they will tell you the first step to prepping is make sure everyone on your block is prepping also right yeah. otherwise yep. you're the one family in the twilight zone who's got the bomb shelter and everybody else is banging on it that's that's, that's not that's not viable right yeah. so the, the the interesting thing to me is that the way our media works and i mean this is what folks like donald trump knew well how to take mm -hmm. advantage of is everybody is looking at the figure and no one is looking at the ground it's like the yeah. great Western crime. We see the subject, but we don't see the landscape. So we we look to the the catastrophe on the screen, but not what are the contributing factors of that. Yeah. Or we look at the solution, but we 
we don't look at the second and third order impacts or effects of it. Mm-hmm. We look at the yep. company and not the externalities. We look at the wealthy billionaire, but not what it costs for him to become the wealthy billionaire. So it was interesting to to use such a provocative hook, like the billionaires who asked me for advice on their bunkers. The hook dominates the conversation to the mm-hmm. point where it's so hard to talk about how did we get here? What is the mindset, and how do we um, how do we think differently? Yeah, and I mean, I think starting with this, as as you were kind of laying out the concept of the mindset, which maybe you could go into a little bit more detail. Mm. I would I couldn't help but uh, as I was listening to the book, because I, I listened to you uh, orate uh, the <laughs> the book rather than reading it, and, and oh, great. I that was a good way to way to get it. Um, as I was listening over the last couple of weeks. I couldn't help but think about the documentary, Adam Curtis's documentary, All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace, mm. and the that kind of technotopia um, idea that we'll be able to somehow design our way out of these problems, you know, with the same, you know, me- machinations that have got us into the problems to begin with, and I feel like that is pretty ever present in kind of how you describe it being as the, the mindset. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, and nothing's nothing, nothing against techno solutionism. If you've got a technology that can solve a problem, that's great. But what most of our technologists aren't realizing is that the the techno solutions they're coming up with always have this caveat, which is how can I save the world with technology? and make a billion dollars in the process. Even things like, you know, the Green New Deal. It's like, well, what about just green? Does it have to be a new deal also? What if it involves sacrifice? You know, what if it involves the wealthiest people on the planet being less wealthy, right? Mm -hmm. What if it means degrowth? What if it means, uh, you know, surrendering something? So it's not about, oh, how can I use technology to make it so everyone can still drive as much as they drive now, only not hurt the planet? Sorry, that actually doesn't work. You're still going to hurt the planet. So maybe we could do a whole lot of stuff and earn a whole lot of money and make cars that are 70% less energy intensive if you don't look at the production and the destruction of the car. Yep. What about the transition (laughs) to that and digging up all the lithium and the rare earth metals and the molybdenum and the slave labor and the stock market and the this and the that and the this and that? How about, wait a minute, what if people don't drive to work? What if people share cars? What if people meet their neighbors? There's so many simpler solutions, but the mindset doesn't allow for that. It's always this pedal to the metal, the next thing that Mm -hmm. doesn't question all the stuff that went before it. We'll, We'll disrupt the car market Mm -hmm. will disrupt the book market will disrupt the hotel market but we won't disrupt the corporate capitalism that's driving it all underneath yeah i mean i as i was also thinking as i was listening to the book about the um you know something that i've i've thought about a lot is is the concept of living off the waste of a wasteful society you know i personally i spent uh 2007 i got about two-thirds of all of the food that i ate from by dumpster diving Mm. and you know have lots of friends that did that know people who still do that now and you know would go to rei and get boots and shoes and clothing out of the dumpster and distribute them to friends and you know really thought about this idea of of living off the waste of a wasteful society but it's it's a uh it is a limited response (laughs) <laughs> like you have to, there, there, there has to be this much waste before we can live off of it. It's that right. overarching system that's not being addressed. And and I think there's a, there's a certain I, idea, you know, a really good friend of mine, his, um, he had a friend who was a flight attendant, you know, and he was like super environmentalist, super against, you know, everything. Also big dumpster diver, you know, all this whole thing, but he would fly all over the world <laughs> uh, because he got free flights you know, and he'd be sta- he'd get he'd be able to do standby, and he'd be filling in an empty seat, so it wouldn't be. But he was still able to to live this lifestyle, right. you know, like the lifestyle wasn't changing, and he had a privilege that allowed him to fly whilst justifying it to himself. Uh, but he was still living the same lifestyle. Like I was still able to get all the same things and eat the same food that I'd be buying at the front of the store by going to the back. But I had a privilege that allowed me to go and do that. And so I think that there is this, you know, you were talking about, like, you know, you didn't say the name, but, you know, uh, fancy electric cars that people are able to, to justify, 
continuing to drive because they feel like they're making this change. And that was one of the other things that I that I thought about a lot while I was listening was that, yes, you know, you're really focusing on, you know, the elite and their escape fantasies. But I think that a, they just have a lot more privilege. I feel like a lot of us have some form of an escape fantasy, you know, that maybe yeah. it's base level preppers or, you know, and you talk about this in the book as well, you know, the history of white flight and, yeah. you know, and, you know, but it also kind of. Another side that we don't necessarily put in the same place, but, you know, people escaping to eco villages and the back to the land movement, which I'm, you know, a child of, uh, you know, is there's there's still a similar kind of concept of trying to figure out how do we escape and prepare for what's coming. Yeah, I mean, I decided to write this book and you're right. I mean, I wrote it after Team Human and Team Human is kind of the. The answer. What do we do? Yep. We'll find the others, you know, meet your neighbors, mm-hmm. start sharing things, all that team human stuff. But um, I decided to write this one um, when COVID happened, you know, partly because mm-hmm. I was going to be directing plays when COVID happened. And I couldn't because mm-hmm. no one yep. was going out or even rehearsing together. But also because I felt like during COVID, the beginning of the pandemic, um, everybody was adopting a bit of that billionaire prepper mindset. You know, oh, maybe it's okay for me to have the Amazon doorbell and Prime mm-hmm. Delivery and Grubhub and Fresh Direct and all the things that, you know, wealthy people get. And fully aware that there's an underclass of people who are exposed and out in the COVID riddled streets, you know, <laughs> you know, what in, in some sense, yeah, working in the meatpacking plants, getting disease. Um, while we're staying in our little homes and the wealthier people in my community, we're getting like private tutors and making these little yep. like private school pods in their backyards and actually getting, and this is the sad part, getting to live the life that they actually kind of secretly wanted to live yep. Yep. all the time. And now they had an excuse to do so. So yeah, I felt like the billionaire mindset was trickling down to everyone that Kids were looking at Elon Musk and thinking that, oh, well, he made he made all this money with, uh, uh, you know, uh, Bitcoin. Maybe mm-hmm. I can produce an NFT, you know, yeah. or, you know, everyone's got their little they're, they're going to get their little claim to stake their claim to the the, the digital thing, mm-hmm. whatever that is that's happening. So I wanted to, to kind of look at that. How have we internalized the the values of these folks? And, you know, and what can we do about that? Yeah. And I mean, I definitely felt that to a certain extent myself. Like, I I feel like, you know, I've I've already I've worked from home for the last decade, just about. And during the pandemic, my wife was working from home, too. It was great. Mm. I wasn't by myself, you know, And, and there was a certain amount of of privilege of being able to stay home. And to be able to to connect to my neighbors, and and I think that was I, not just something that I you know I'm I'm living in this town of about 225 people in the woods behind Oakland, mm. um, you know that's in semi autonomous unintentional community that was very well set up to be able to adapt for these situations, you know, and we'd already had you know here in California the just terrible fires, you know, right. that, you know, like the year bef- that had been coming for the last number of years, I mean, starting really in 2017, that was partially one of the genesis of, of this show, um, you know, the Tubbs fire there in Northern California. And, you know, year after year, we had these huge fire events, these big smoke events, and we, you know, started distributing masks and building air filters for each other. And so when the pandemic came, like we already had the social infrastructure set up. I was, I was you know, very fortunate to do that. I'd, I'd only just left uh, the community house. I was living in Oakland with 14 people like three months before the pandemic happened. And it was very well-timed, much better to be in, in my own place within a community of 225. Um, but I, I feel like a lot of people like, you know, that were on the ground you know, in communities all over the place did very similar things where they, they took this shock uh, and they withstood and they figured, you know, this is my opportunity to connect with my neighbors. You know, there's there's now a reason that I can justify going and knocking on their door to see if right. I can offer support in some way. You know, and that was kind of one of the, the benefits that came out. You know, really, that that's kind of the the disaster collectivism. That's the mutual aid. But on the other side, 
there was a certain amount of that disaster capitalism. And, you know, something you talk about in the book is the, the great reset and right. this kind of top down opportunism. Um, and wonder if you can kind of just kind of talk about that, that juxtaposition between that kind of difference between uh, the disaster capitalism and the disaster collectivism. Well, yeah, disaster collectivism is what, you know, most of your listeners probably already, you know, yeah. think about yeah. and believe in, which is, you know, the more, uh, the more, you know, your neighbors, the more you're borrowing them, the more resilient your community will be and the less likely a disaster will befall you, you know, yeah. and if a disaster or catastrophe does, you're going to be a whole lot better situated. You know, it's like the, um, you know, the, the blacks outside Tulsa, you know, mm -hmm. who had, you know, black main street that people know about now from watching the watchmen, but this was a community of people who were, you know, legally cut off from the larger national economy because they were black. They weren't allowed to be part of it. So there's no Walmart. Um, but because of that, there was also no great sucking sound from corporate America. They had to be self-sufficient, so they ended up developing the, the, the means for, for a basic circular economy where I invest in your business and your business does better than my main street is better than my tax base goes up then my schools are better you know so they're all it's a circular investment where, where instead of earning ten dollars once you're you're earning one dollar ten times and the yeah. communities got really wealthy and then the white communities near them that were supposed to be wealthier because they were connected to the big economies were looking at this black community and going wait a minute why are they doing well why are they middle class and I'm still poor and that's why they went and rioted. You know, but those mm -hmm. basic techniques are what we're talking about as sort of uh, disaster collectivism, which you don't even need the disaster to do it. I mean, yeah. fortunately, you, you, yeah. you got to make a hole in the wall. What are you going to do? Most people are you going to go to Home Depot, get a minimum viable product drill, you know, that you'll charge up and maybe use for that one mm -hmm. hole and maybe you'll get it working for the second one. Then it's busted and you throw it out. Right. Instead of what? Just going Go to Sam's house, knock on the door and say, Sam, can I borrow your drill? I know it's hard. It's really hard to go and have the guts to ask Sam to borrow his drill because then Sam's wife may ask you for something, right? She may ask you to help her kid with math homework or to help them, you know, get the hold the Christmas tree while they put the base under it. These horrible, horrible things that it turns <laughs> out are the most fun, great, wonderful bonding experiences yeah. you'll ever have in your life is holding up the Christmas tree or, or giving a math lesson to the neighbor's dyslexic kid and realizing, right. oh, that's why you see threes backwards. You know, you might want to check this out. And all of a sudden, everybody loves you because you figured something out and help their lives. It's like, ah, um, no. The other way is basically what what most of our tech bros do. It's like they go to, you know, Burning Man and do some ayahuasca and then, you know, Mother Earth speaks to them and it's like, oh, you know, Elon, you know, or Peter, I'm dying and, and I'm, I'm, you know, my, my, my trees are the air and the people can't breathe. Save me. And then, you know, on the G5 back to back to Mountain View, they go, oh, I'm going to develop a software stack to save humanity. And it's going to be for these eco cities with blockchain management and 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 recycled pee and and all the solar this and all that as long as i can just clear cut a forest and build my sim city village <laughs> there and it's where you get you know and these are the same guys that will end up going to the klaus schwab at the world economic forum and help him develop you know game b or the great <laughs> reset or civilization 2.0 which is always you know let's use technology to get everything on the blockchain and build carbon sequestration technologies and desalinization plants and basically Pedal to the metal so that rather than the, the one unmovable piece of the pie, the unmovable piece of the puzzle is international, international corporate conglomerate mm -hmm. capitalist uh, uh, investment and extraction. That stays the same, but now we can do it by sending kids into mines to get rare earth metals to build your, mm -hmm. you know, uh, lithium batteries for your solar panels and all that. 
And it, it nothing against solar panels. I'm sure they're better than burning oil, you know, and probably nuclear is better than burning oil for that matter. But even if we want to transition everybody to everything all the time, just read your, you know, watch your Nate Hoggins movie. You know, you're, you're, you're going to have to. Uh, the, the the cost of transition is so great that the only yeah. solution is to use less energy yeah. while we transition to something yeah. else, not transition in order to keep using as much energy as we are. Yeah, but that's not sexy. That's not comfortable. Right. It's not <laughs> sexy. It's not comfortable. And you don't make a billion, billion dollars, dollars off it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, and that's you know, the thing. Yeah. You, you, uh, you ever watch George Carlin? And yeah. He goes down, you know, the problem with, with homelessness is that there's no money in it. If there was money in it, people would go, would go after it. But there's not if, – if everybody could skim off a little bit of money on the top and on the side here and there, we'd have those solutions. I mean I think that's yeah. one of the, the, the big things is that, you know, we're not going to be able to incre you know, continue to increase our, our energy consumption, continue to, to live with outside of our bounds. There, there does have to be a certain amount of degrowth. And right. – and it can feel great. I mean, that's the thing. Like during the pandemic, you know, people weren't driving around so much. And we saw, uh, you know, the amount of carbon emissions go down for the first time, you know, in the last however many decades. And people got to feel like what it was to stay and be a member of their communities in a weird way, like you're saying, getting deliveries, not interacting in the same amount of ways, you know, whatever. But they were able to, to have a greater sense of place. And and a sense of belonging. I mean, that's one of the things that I really focus in on a lot was that, you know, while it was it felt like the first time where there was people all over the world that were all dealing with the same crises at the same time in, you know, because, yes, we're we're dealing with climate change and and but it's all these different symptoms all over the place. Yeah. You know, we're dealing with capitalism, with extractionism, but it's all these different symptoms that were different. And this was the first yeah. time that we were able to focus in on a single symptom. But think about what we're doing here. We're here trying to sell the upper middle class on the idea of community and relationship yeah. and fun. You know, it's like, hey, guys, it's going to be OK. It's going to be all right. You know, you could meet your neighbors. You could maybe have sex. You could maybe play baseball or football with people or yeah. enjoy other people's kids. There's this like it could be fun. Um, that we have to actually do that is the funny thing because, and that's where the mindset is so, yeah. uh, so awful. You know, these are folks who, you know, and I tell this story about, you know, it's at the end of the book, how, when I was a kid, we lived in Queens, we were working class and there was one barbecue pit at the end of the block. Everybody used it. It would be like torched from Friday evening right through Sunday afternoon. Your mom would send you down with some weenies. Some neighbor's mom would – would would well, to me, the neighbor's mom. But yeah. To her, it's a neighbor. Um, would then cook the weenies for your kid, you know? And, and, and I, I – we trusted each other. They cooked yeah. our weenies. And, and we ate. And it was – this great fun weekend long thing kids would play kickball and whatever dodgeball around at the end of the block and it was it was it was great then my dad made more money we moved to Larchmont then to Scarsdale these wealthier mm -hmm. uh, upper middle class Westchester towns and all of a sudden uh, there's no barbecue pit at the end of the block. That's day class A. That's what poor people do. Everyone had their own barbecue mm -hmm. in their own backyard. But you don't are barbecuing with the Jones anymore. Now you're kind yeah. of barbecuing against the Joneses. And they've got porterhouse and you've got filet mignon, so they get <laughs> lobsters. You get Kobe beef. It's like who's got the best one? And but 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 it was awful. It was me, my brother, my mom, and my dad alone at our barbecue yeah. because we're wealthy now. And it's like, and that it's so hard to get that out of people's heads that no, you don't want a, a private resort in Aspen. That's not mm -hmm. happy. That's sad. That's, yeah. that's you know, and and it's 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 tricky. And no matter and with diseases, it helps kind of recreate the excuse. Oh well, mm -hmm. now there's COVID. Now there's RSV. Now there's the flu. So I guess we do need our own little thing. It's like no, actually. Mm -hmm. You don't. It's the it's the isolation and industrialization of our of our society that makes these sicknesses and diseases. Mm -hmm. These are the result of industrialization. Not um, uh, it's not that industrialization saves us from it. Yeah, I think that's. I guess those that that kind of lack of wait. Let me just back up. 
So you were talking about the, the how weird it is that we somehow need to sell this concept to the middle class. And, you know, I feel like the reason why we have to sell it is that it is a counter narrative to what has been sold, like you were saying, for the last 50, 70 years, you know, coming mm -hmm. out of World War II. And, you know, the, the mechanation, the better living through chemistry, the up, upward mobility that has been, pro, been, you know, we've been programmed, you know, and I, I think that to, to draw from the title of your previous book, Program or Be Programmed, you know, we have been programmed to live a certain way. And it made sense at the time. Right. There was no environment to worry about. You know, that that wasn't people hadn't imagined that yet. It's the end of World War Two, a whole bunch of guys are going to be coming back from the war. They didn't want them to all be crazy like they were when they came back from World War One. It was bad scene. You know, as yep. if those guys were not they were not happy. So like, OK, what are we going to do? I guess do a GI Bill. Let's build Levittown, put mm -hmm. everyone in their own little house. Don't create any bars or places for them to gather so they won't like unionize and, mm -hmm. and, and get all crazy. Give them a everyone a little bit of a mortgage so they got something to worry about so they have to keep their job it was a it was a a plan for social control you know and yeah. it was it developed in part by you know margaret mead and, and yeah. gregory bateson and smart social scientists and anthropologists for fdr thinking it would it would be good and in some ways you know so much of what we do is based in that kind of war almost prison camp mentality you know what we understand about human beings as economic actors is generally it's based in this thing called the prisoner's dilemma mm -hmm. which is this sort of you know game theory thing but the idea is you're 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 talking to two prisoners <laughs> right it's two people in jail so yeah. right if you're in jail in a situation where someone is going to have to go and spend a long time in jail um how are you going to make your choices well that is not those are not the preconditions. Those are not the underlying assumptions of human society. You know, the fact is we live in an ab on an abundant planet with more than enough to go mm -hmm. around, even with 8 billion people here. Yep. And if we adopted a commons-based model of how do we share the abundance rather than how do we market the scarcity, um, we end up with a very different reality. And it's not Rocket science. The hmm. only people it doesn't favor are the super wealthy, selfish people who want hmm. a disproportionate share and need to keep us competing with each other in order to maintain their their uh, uh, monopoly hmm. on power over us. For as long as they possibly can, even if it's to the bitter end. I mean, I think that's Even if the, it's to the bitter end. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's kind of what really stands out for me, you know, with the like bunker mentality. Is they need a bitter end, yeah, because they're stuck in the Marvel end game. You know, a Marvel nope. movie doesn't work unless you get that end game, and you can't justify being that evil and selfish to other people unless we are on a Titanic. So yep. they love climate change because climate yep. change means you see, I'm justified in getting my AK 47 equivalent nuclear tranche, you know, eco farm, you know, for me, my gorgeous wife, and 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 70 harem members, you know, so I can spread my seed and eventually go to Mars and build yeah. a dome and terraform and do all I'm going to do. Yeah. I mean, it what is. What if it doesn't end? You know, yeah. that's the real nightmare for them. What yeah. if we're not going to do climate change? What if we don't? Then, you know, it's like that family that comes out of the bunker in the Twilight Zone episode. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, false alarm. Uh oh. Uh, <laughs> right, because he didn't let anybody in there. So yep. you no, know, these the, the, these these guys are working under a presumption of of uh, a survival of the fittest, you know, uh, mm -hmm. battle till there's just one person left standing. That until there's a rapture. I mean, that's yeah. the. I mean, really, it it like that. You go back and, and you look at history. You look at the. There is kind of an art. This is like a continuation of of a kind of archetypical idea that, you know, at some point in time, this is all going to end. And how can I make sure that I'm one of the chosen ones that gets to survive for as long as possible? I mean, that's survival of the richest. Right. Uh, you know, and I think that's. But at the same time, do all these tech million and billionaires really want to live with each other in a bunker? No, Are they, they want to live get alone along? in a bunker. 
I mean, I guess they they're not going to live with each other. Each <laughs> yeah. has their own. Yeah. Maybe they're networked on Mastodon, yeah. right? Yeah. So they <laughs> they have a satellite through which they communicate. But no, each one has his own harem. Yeah. It's the Jeffrey Epstein thing when he was building in New Mexico. You know, it's yep. had like forty bedrooms for his teenage brides. You know, to all to all you know, birth his little babies and stuff. You know, and I'm sure he'd rotate them out so they'll always be. You know. 10 available ones and 30 pregnant ones. And he'll get he'll get older and they'll stay the same age. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, there was a guy in Game of Thrones who was doing that. Yeah. Who would only keep the females. It's like that was thinking about, yeah, that's sort of that's that's the that's the Jeffrey Epstein dream right there. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, another point that I was as you were as I was listening to the book that I was thinking about is and this is something when you started talking about. In, in the book, you, t- you talk a lot about uh, – not a lot, but there was a chapter that you focus in on a friend of yours who got kind of sucked into QAnon. Mm. And it was making me think of, of something that I've thought about a lot is the, the, the bliss of certainty, you know, the, the knowing that you know how things are. You know, and it can come from the I know things that other people don't know, you know, or I'm, I'm an early adopter and so I understand. But the idea of being st- – being having the opportunity to feel so right about something, you know, so right that this the event is going to come, and I'm going to be out in front of it, is definitely a feeling that I don't think I have ever had, or if I've had it, I've never had it for very long. Uh, you know, and at times I've been really jealous of friends of mine and people around that are able to be so sure of the things that they're sure about. I think as I've gotten older, I've I've gotten further and fur- further away from surety. Um, but I, I don't know how how much that kind of ties into this as well. Well, certainly in the in the, I have a lot of stories about uh, people who are kind of uh, uh, orthodox it, uh, scientism mm-hmm. members. I don't mean scientists. Scientists ask questions. They use models. Yep. But people who are scientistic um, about things experience this kind of certainty, this atheistic certainty of, about how the world is. It's just like nothing going on here. Just move along. Nothing yep. to see here. This is all materialist. You're just atoms and consciousness <laughs> is this emergent illusion. You know, the DNA perpetrates on a <laughs> mammal in order to get us to, to, to keep it going. And, you know, and this is you know, real scientists, guys like, uh, you know, Richard Dawkins believe that. <laughs> but yep. the problem is when you're that scientistic, that we're just at the mercy of our genes, um, uh, eugenics is one step away from that. I mean, there's a reason that, that Jeffrey Epstein was funding the very scientists that mm-hmm. I was engaging with in, in John literary agent John Brockman's living room, because they are all just saying – Look, people are responding passively to genetic code and mimetic code, and mm-hmm. all you need to do is learn enough uh, behavioral economics to manipulate all these people into doing what you want. So, you know, he on the one hand, he'd have the scientists there, and then he would do these um, – Brockman would – these these seminars on – uh, behavioral economics and folks like Bezos and and mm-hmm. you know Larry and Sergey Sergey would show up at these things because it's like oh this is what matters how do we yeah. manipulate the masses with our technology and the other ones the kids then go to a BJ Fogg's department at Stanford to figure mm-hmm. out you know a technology behavioral modification and then they end up taking the you know the algorithms from the Las Vegas slot machines and putting them in the the social media feeds and then the ones that finally see the light and go, oh my God, I see how terrible this is. What they do is flip it. They go, oh, we were wizards and manipulating people in order to take all their money. Now we're going to be wizards and manipulating yeah. people to get them to do good. You know, how do we get people to this and get people to mm-hmm. that? And, and you know, I don't even have to mention the names of these organizations. And some of them are very well-meaning, psychedelic, esalen going, you know, technologists. Mm-hmm. But it's the same crazy thing. As soon as somebody's telling you um, they're going to teach you, like, sense-making, right? You know mm-hmm. – <laughs> only cultism, only cultism mm-hmm. go, don't let anybody make sense for you. You know, yeah. like the QAnon people say, do your own research, you know, <laughs> but, but really do it. Right? Yeah. Don't just read tweets. Um, you know, just really. Uh, and, and the real research means what's your actual experience of life and others? And do we need this is the other thing. And it was always so amazing to me with my friends who became Q. Um, it's like. How dare we even have opinions on any of this? I remember I got called. I, I agreed to all these uh, uh, like 
interviews, you know, people text. And usually it's not mm. that they know me or it's just I became a name that someone to call. And I agreed to some interview on, on uh, uh, some podcast or radio show or something by email. And then I do it, you know, and I hook it up and they're like, so tell us, um, you know, what do you think of, of President Biden's Afghanistan withdrawal strategy? <laughs> And I'm like, uh, I don't really know much. Well, sure, but yeah, but everybody on Twitter is talking about it. You know, it's like, so what, what do you think? Of it? I, I know nothing about how do you withdraw from war. I really don't know how it's done. It looks really bad. I mean, I see it on TV, and there's all these people trying to get on airplanes. It looks like a real mess. But I don't know how you do it. I don't know that I would be able to do any better. I mean. Do you plan it longer or do, they, do you plan it shorter or get more planes there? Do you get, get, get Dick Cheney and Halliburton in there? I don't know. But the fact that everybody thinks they need an opinion, that millions of people need yeah. to tweet what they think about the Afghan withdrawal strategy or anything like that. It's like I remember saying to the person on the radio, I said, well, what if just 100,000 people worked on that problem? Just take 100,000 to sit on a special Twitter group and let them tweet about it so the other 100 million don't have to, you know. And anyway, I'm just yeah. going to vote for somebody who, who, who is going to pick somebody. And I mean, it, 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 not to say don't care about the world, but we could spend 99% of each of our effort on our local problems mm -hmm. rather than looking at the giant generic ones. And yeah. we can at least alleviate so much pressure from these big things if you're getting your food from a computer community you know a community sourced agriculture um uh, you know go, go to a, a csa or a club mm -hmm. then well you're that much less stress on this ridiculous global System. supply chain yep. for food you're that much less of a customer for industrial agriculture you've done so much more in that than you have tweeting angrily about how something is done and there's enough people there's aoc will worry about the big question you know there's enough people to do that, that for us to just gosh just get there to be one lawnmower on your block instead mm -hmm. of 10 you know tutor your neighbor's kids babysit find the old people help mm -hmm. them dig your neighbor out from under the flood there's like more than enough for us to do and the more of us focus on that the better. I mean, it's why mm -hmm. I'm really, I'm thinking the only way to set that example is to stop writing books and stop mm -hmm. being public and just return to local myself, not with mm -hmm. a mic drop, but with a whimper and yeah. just be like, I'm, I'm off doing something, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I said my piece, you know, good night. Well, I think there's a, I think there's a happy medium there. Yeah. I mean, I, th I, th I mean, I think that there's, but like you're saying, like there's, how, how do you, relieve some of the pressure off of the system, the, the systems we don't necessarily believe in, that we're, yeah. that we're, we're semi-trapped in, but there is a pathway forward. Yes. There is a pathway out. It's why- Even if it's know, incremental. Even right. if it's incremental. Step by step. Step right. by step. Yeah, even if it's small. I mean, it's why, you know, for years I've been wanting to raise rabbits. The pandemic came. What did I do? I started raising rabbits so that I eat? could provide a certain amount of my own meat. And you would eat. Did you eat a rabbit? I killed the rabbit, processed the rabbit, eat the rabbit. I had rabbit for breakfast this morning. Really? Is it and, true that if you kill a rabbit wrong, you'll get poisoned? Uh, I've never heard that. I heard you can't just cut them up and eat them, that you have to take the skin off in a particular way. Or oh, you sure. Yeah, yeah. you got to make sure you don't rip the organs and you can you can release bile and all sorts of things. But it's there's a you watch a 15 minute YouTube video and you're out really? there raising and processing rabbits. Wow. I mean, they, and like, do they love you before you kill them? Yeah, they, you give like, them nice. You give them nice, loving, loving. You feed them real well. You let them run around. You do the whole thing and you're <laughs> providing meat for yourself and for your neighbors. And, and, you know, I trade rabbits for friends to, to come and do work on my place. And it's, it's here's like a rabbit. an amazing gift. Yeah. You know, we're cooked Living. rabbit meal, and it, and it's something that I was able to do, and it didn't take very much space. It didn't wow. take very much time to learn how to do it, and it's intense. The idea of processing your own meat and having to do that—I mean, the first time that I ever killed an animal on myself by myself, yeah. I, I cried. It was terrible. I would like, think, I, like I do it with other. And now people. you just cut them up and you make jerky without nope. a second thought. But I don't. I, I I put on Yo Yo Ma. And I play right. cello concertos and I let them run around in the garden and eat some final greens and uh, like and, and love them and take them? care Gently, of them. Like with pills or something? So no, I, I actually I use a high powered air rifle um, and take them out with a single shot in the back of the neck. I mean, this is 
But this is what close up, close up. I mean, this is while they're yeah. while they're eating some greens. Right. In you're the not garden, chasing them down like, with it. No, yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> like letting them have a final moment. They're getting to run around right. the garden where I brought them out before, where they feel comfortable, and they're having a snack, and they're in the best position possible. And I do it with another person. I don't do it by myself because it's really an, right. an intense and you say prayers process. of some kind. You say you something know, special. I talk to them or give them give them some final love and yeah. know that it's all part of the process. And I'm eating meat out in the world. But yeah. this is just an example. Not everybody's yeah. going to be able to get around to do that. It's, yeah, but it's a whole I, and thing. And I didn't go straight straight there. You know, we 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 had ducks before, and we would love yeah. and cuddle the ducks. And again, Yo Yo Ma is like the go to like thing. But right, you, you find the thing that works for yourself. I'm going to do the crickets. I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. I've got Cricket a friend that, that that was trying to start a business. Do that. I ate a lot of crickets for a while. Yeah. Um, and but you you figure out you know what is your entry point? What is what where where in the system? Can you pull away in some way right. that one supports yourself, but also there's not enough food in my community. If there's a disaster right. that happens, I, that's a skill that's going to be necessary. And how can I bring something? How can I simultaneously that's put, good. put on yeah, that I was air mask for myself uh, and somebody else? Yeah, I was going to learn modern first aid. Like I know, yeah. I know first aid from the seventies, but I can get you know get an EMT patch and I was mm-hmm. like, oh well, Doug, oh someone's hurt, Doug, come help. And yeah. so like, Tom, you know, yeah. I'm hungry. Can I? Got an extra rabbit, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it's Come like I'll over. set your I'll yeah. set your kneecap when yeah. you break it or whatever, and get it get it in a cast, and you give me a rabbit, and we're all good. Yeah, or we have a huge feast, and people all show up, and they bring what little bit they have, and we do a we do a big you know stone soup, and I've got my my GM uh. my non GMO soup stone that I travel around the world <laughs> doing big stone soups and getting people to remember how to share. And, you know, yeah. and, and again, you bring the little piece that you have and maybe, maybe you don't, maybe you don't have the medical skills. Maybe you're not able to raise the rabbit, but that's okay. You're a member right. of the community. You, you, you show up in other ways. You've showed up in the past and we honor the way that you've shown up right. in the past by taking care of you in the present. Yeah. And the and, fact is the majority of people don't really need the skills. The majority of people are going to be like, fill these sandbags with sand, yeah. you know, Go dig over there. We're putting in the – you stick the little seedlings in like this, yep. you know, or somebody get to clean out the fucking chicken shit from the yep. coop. Yeah. You know, and it's not it's not rocket science. And I'll let the other guy will be the permaculture expert who will know how to rotate the crops yeah. in the thing <laughs> and send me out and tell me what to do. Yeah. But I think that's – I mean that really is what the response can and I think is looking like. I mean, like yeah. again, like we saw that with the pandemic. We're seeing this in, in, you know, in fits and starts. You know, there's pockets of people that are thinking about this stuff, and the more yeah. that we're able to connect with others, the more we're able to find the others, and again, do this together. I mean, that's yeah. like that's what I said, like what I was saying before. You know, the first time that I killed an animal, it was it was a chicken, and there was five of us, and we all mm. did it together, and it was a, a yeah. shared process you know and so it made it so that i felt comfortable doing that moving forward i found the others yeah. that i could learn from at, at, that i could build build off of and the funny thing is you know uh, i was doing a talk and someone was saying well you know what do you do you think that, you know wealthy people or even the upper middle class would want to go do these horrible manual labor after they've been to college and they're part of the elite and i'm like what do you think the multimillionaires do when they retire they do craft beer. Yep. They do gardening. They do hunting. It's like they're doing all the things that we're kind of asking them to do now. They do it when they don't have to work anymore. Yep. So maybe, just maybe, these kinds of things, making candles, yep. you know, <laughs> g- collecting honey, all the stuff that we could do to actually stay alive in an in a environmentally sound way, uh, you know, maybe, just maybe, uh, these, are, these are fun things. And – at the same time, do what we can to get in front of it to reduce th- how bad these disasters are going to be moving forward. Yeah. Figure out how to become more welcoming. It's not even avoiding them anymore. Yeah. Right. It's it, no, not it, avoiding it, them. It's no. just making them the, 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 the crash a little softer, which it's, we can still do. It's harm reduction. And, mm-hmm. and that, you know, we a couple of years ago, we did a, a, full, a, a year-long research project into how – different climate disasters and COVID were impacting um, harm reduction service providers, people that were supporting people who use drugs. And it was whilst doing that project that I realized, really thought about, you know, all of this 
kind of disaster response as being a form of harm reduction. It never kind of triggered in the same way. And so it's it's figuring out, yeah, how do we reduce the impact of of these, you know, maybe not the event, but the events that are going to be coming, no matter what we do now, best case scenario, they're going to co continue to come for, for decades and they're going to get worse before they get better. And so we have to figure out how do we work with each other? How do we not demonize our neighbors? How do we reduce the secondary and, and third you know, term harm of these disasters? And it starts by showing up, getting to know our neighbors and reducing othering, you know, in times when there is not a disaster. Right. So I think we should probably leave it on that. I don't know if there's anything else you want to say before we wrap up. No, I would keep up the good work. <laughs> it's, uh... it's great talking it's, to uh... you. Yeah, I mean, I guess the only thing I'd say is, I mean, I think the reason to buy my book, if you want to, or to get it from a library, even better, um, is it's empowering to be able to laugh at these folks. Yeah. Sometimes Peter Thiel and Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, they can seem scary, you know, but when you actually are with them and talking with them and hearing how they think about AI and money and all the things they're afraid of, you realize, oh, these guys are the losers. They're not the winners. They're crazy little loser people. And we, we are so much better off not trying to emulate them or even live in response to them or in reaction to them, but just let's just go about our business. And if we do, it will necessarily deflate their empires. The less mm -hmm. dependent you are on buying some electronic vehicle from musk you know the better no well thank you i think we'll end end on that this has been an interview with douglas rushkoff part of our bi-weekly series that is now available in both podcast and youtube you can check out douglas's new book survival of the richest escape fantasies of tech billionaires and the team human podcast and there's dobby and make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel here and follow the Response Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. And you can find out more from us and listen to past interviews and audio documentaries at thereresponsepodcast.org or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you back in two weeks. Until next time, take care of each other. And Dobby. <laughs> Mind your, yeah, be, be kind to your house elves. <laughs> or maybe set them by setting them free. <laughs> Set them free. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, he is a free elf for a few days anyway. All right. Have a nice evening. All right. You take care.